All right, all right. Today we're going to finish up all of our different fossil groups. And so there's fewer fossil groups today, but they're also fun ones, lots of micro fossils in today's lab. So we're going to start with foraminifera. Foraminifera are these really cool single cell organisms. They are called protists. They're from a kingdom called Protista. <laughs> and they have a, cal for the most part, they have a calcareous rich shell. Calcareous, remember, means calcite rich. Um, sometimes they're hollow like completely and sometimes they're chambered. And there are some foraminifera that live on the bottom of the sea and they're called benthic foraminifera. And there are other foraminifera that are planktic, meaning that they float around. They're not um, free swimming. They just are, their uh, direction and locomotion is determined by the seafloor current or not seafloor current, but sea current um, because they live usually towards the top of the water column. So it's probably pretty obvious of two things. And one is that they're really small. So here's a bar scale here that says 500 microns. Uh, foraminifera are all about a millimeter or so in diameter. Some of them are larger, but the vast majority of them are very, very small. Um, the other thing that's kind of obvious is the planktic have this sort of sugary, thicker texture and these benthic foraminifera are very thin, almost translucent. You can pretty much see through them. And that's a result. It's an evolutionary result of where they live. Benthic foraminifera live in very quiet water at the bottom of the seafloor. So there's no waves really to break up their shell, but planktic forams live in the waves. And so planktic foraminifera have to have a thicker, more robust shell so that they're not crushed in waves. Our next group are also microfossils. These microfossils, however, are made of phosphate and not calcite. So these guys are called conodonts, and I want you to look up here first. So conodonts are, I actually, my, uh, my advisor at Geneseo when I was an undergrad was a conodont expert, and he had us all memorize the definition of a conodont. It is a phosphatic tooth-like remain of an extinct eel-like organism. So if you've ever seen sort of like a lagfish or a lamprey, they kind of are about the length of your pinky or so, and they are just creepy, ugly little creatures, but they're believed to be some of the first chordates or the first organisms with a backbone or a spine. And we are descended from them actually. They had teeth, their teeth were very small. You can see that these are again, about a millimeter in length, um, but their teeth were made of phosphate. And so while the hagfish or the conodont organism, the animal didn't survive, its teeth did. And we can find these microfossils in lots of different places, um, but definitely in lots of sedimentary rocks. And what's also fun is that the organisms evolved ve relatively rapidly, so their teeth change shape pretty regularly. We can use these teeth for a process called biostratigraphy. Biostratigraphy is where you can identify rock layers um, sort of based on the fossils that are within them. Stratigraphy is the study of layered rocks. So this is the study of looking at the biology inside layered rocks. They can also be used by the petroleum and natural gas industries. So it turns out that conodonts actually change color, which is kind of cool. Um, and they have what's called the conodont alteration index or the CAI, conodont alteration index. And when the temperature is low, um, they're actually white. And as the temperature goes up on the rock layer that they are found in, they change color. They go from like a light, um, sort of Coors Light colored beer, if you will. Um, in fact, that's how this was taught to me, is that it was all compared to beer, which is not necessarily the best way to learn. But um, you can see that the conodons got darker as the temperature increased, and eventually when you got a conodont that was black, um, it was at conodont alteration index of five. The ones that we're looking at here are probably more of a four. And then they get gray and white and then clear. Um, it turns out that natural gas and oil is um, found in, con in rock layers that have a CAI of three to five. So by looking at the um, color of the conodonts, it actually tells you if the potential for oil and gas exists in the rock layers. But conodonts are, again, very small, microscopic, but really useful to solve some geologic problems. 
the third creepy small creature we're going to look at um, looks like this when it's alive and looks like absolutely nothing in the fossil record. They actually look like little kidney beans or something. These are called ostracods. Ostracods are very small arthropods. They have a little calcareous shell. They swim around in water. If you've ever been in a lake or a pond and you feel like something creepy is nibbling at your legs, it's probably ostracods. They're very common. They're common in estuaries, which is where fresh and salt water mix and you get brackish water, which is what that is there. They're found in salt water. They're found in freshwater environments and they can be very, very small to again, about the size of a pea or so. They are epibenthic, meaning that they live on the top of the bottom. They can also swim. They are suspension feeders. They will filter food out of the water um, and they can be scavengers, meaning that they'll eat Eat other critters that are dead. Um, we're gonna get a little bit bigger with our fossils in this next organism. These are called graptolites. Graptolites are extinct. Uh, graptolites are also relatively common in the rock layers around Rochester. They almost they are characteristic for having this sort of sawtooth pattern and um, it's believed that they were nectic and planktic um, that they sort of floated around but they could possibly have been free swimming. They're there. They were likely incredibly thin organisms, um, incredibly delicate. We only find them in black shales for the most part, black and gray shales. And what's important about black and gray shales is that, first of all, it's very, very quiet water where shales are forming stagnant water, in fact. Um, and then the other thing is that when you have black shales, it means there's no oxygen in the water. So there weren't really organisms to decompose the graptolites, which is why they're preserved. Um, they're characteristic for having these sawtooth branches and there's no scale on any of these figures, which is not good, but uh, graptolites could be anywhere from about one inch to about four inches in length or so. All right, our next fossil group is one of everyone's favorite to collect. Those are called trilobites. So trilobites were very diverse from the Cambrian when they first appeared, um, I think pretty much through the Permian when they went extinct in one of the largest mass, ex the, the largest mass extinction that is known. Um, they had a variety of shapes, but a same general body plan. You can see that there's obviously a lot of similarities between these organisms, um, but there are clearly differences as well. And during the Ordovician period, trilobites gained the ability to coil up very much like a pill bug today. Um, and they are trilobites because they are trilobed, three lobes. They were arthropods. They had a head, which is called the cephalon. They had a body called the thorax, and they had a trilobut, which is called the pigidi. Trilobites were also composed of calcite, and so they preserve relatively well in the geologic record. Most of the time, though, they're found broken, and that's, again, because of these trilobes. They broke apart in wave as a result of wave action. Trilobites lived in a lot of different environments. They can be nectobenthic. They could. They're dead, right? Um, so they could live on the bottom, but were capable of swimming. They lived on the top of the bottom. Some of them burrowed as well. Uh, the New York State fossil is our next fossil group. They are called Eurypterids. And one of the things based on what we just said that you might think is that Eurypterids also broke apart. Eurypterids are some of the large, the, is the largest known group of arachnids on earth. They are the official New York state fossil. Um, I didn't give you a size on trilobites. Trilobites can be about an inch long to a couple feet in length. Um, Eurypterids though can be enormous. Eurypterids could have, um, Eurypterids are also extinct by the way. Eurypterids, um, could be probably a good 20 feet in length, a full grown giant Eurypterid. Um, they are incredibly creepy. They are often called sea scorpions. And um, we have them in some of the rock layers um, that are found um, a little bit south of Rochester. Um, and then kind of extend sort of east west across New York state. But good stuff, really cool. They are nectic. They were. They were nectic predators that lived in warm, shallow water, which New York State used to be hundreds of millions of years ago. All right. You can't really tell from these particular pictures, but these are sponges. The scientific name for sponge is periphera. Um, sponges are these very large complex organisms, but they're actually composed of 
micro um, like structures that are called spicules. So while periphera are multicellular organisms, um, the spicules preserve really well because they're created, they're made of calcite and silica. And that's what we see here. These are even smaller than, uh, the spicules anyway, are even smaller than conodonts. They might be a half a millimeter or smaller. Um, and you'll see some of those under a microscope as well. But that's one of the characteristics of sponges is that they have both like a sample that you can hold in your hand and one that you can look at under the microscope. They are all epibenthic suspension feeders. So they sucked food out of the water that was drifting by and thought deep sponge thoughts. All right, these are plants. That shouldn't be too shocking. So here we have a leaf, a fern, and here we have part of the bark of a tree. Um, plants are their own kingdom. There's actually several different phyla of plants, but we're just going to collectively think about them as plants. So plants are multicellular. They're also autotrophs, which means that they make their own food. They can be found on land and in the ocean, and they're most often preserved in low energy, quiet water environments. And that's again, because they don't get ripped apart so much by uh, by waves and current in those low energy environments like swamps, like lagoons that we learned about, which is the area between the mainland and the barrier islands, mud, tidal flats or mud flats where in between where the tide rises and falls is where these guys are gonna be preserved. Good stuff. And then our last group are called annelids. Annelids are these tubes that you see here. Um, so I really, I really like this picture, but there's no scale. So here's a picture of a bunch of annelids in a man's hand. So annelids are worm tubes um, that are preserved in sediment. Sometimes they are found sort of encrusted um, on shells. And they're basically the result of worms feeding and moving around. And as they do, sometimes worms will secrete a shell, like a, um, they will secrete minerals as they move through and they kind of excrete material from their body. It will form a, a tube basically. And those are called annelid tubes. So that's it. You only have nine fossil groups today and, um, it's not, not so painful. It's kind of fun. When you get done, I invite you to look back over last week's lab and this week's lab and think about key, how you're going to keep all those names straight. If you are a person who likes flashcards, this is, this is your time. <laughs> you're going to want to do this. Um, because this is something that students sometimes stumble a bit with on the midterm. All right, that's it. Have fun.